Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending my webinar this morning. This is Ben Kieser with Applied Flow Technology, and very excited to be talking to you today about the AFT Fathom GSC and AFT Fathom XTS add-on modules. They are very useful tools, major time savers, and uh, they will uh, give you a lot of uh, additional and enhanced capability for your flow modeling. Um, and uh, so before I get started, I need to do one thing really quick. Uh, we use a internal uh, Skype for uh, chatting with each other here at AFT, and I had to turn it off really quick. That way I don't get distracted. Okay, <laughs> ready to begin. Uh, just so that everyone knows, there's a few handouts that are available in today's webinar. There's a uh, data sheets for the uh, Fathom 10 uh, add-on modules, uh, GSC and XTS and SSL, uh, and uh, both English and metric units. And then I also provided a copy of uh, the PDF of my webinar. So for those of you listening live, you have access to the uh, copy of my webinar uh, presentation right now. If you are uh, listening to the recording, this webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent to you. Excuse me, that way you'll be able to watch it later on. So if you are listening into the recorded version, uh, email me at benkeiser at aft.com, B E N K E I S E R at AFT.com, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of my webinar presentation as well. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just a couple quick things. I wanted to highlight the uh, AFT products that we have available. There's AFT Fathom, AFT Aero, and AFT Impulse. Basically, we're able to model liquid systems, gas systems, and slurry systems uh, very, very well. And there's... Uh, uh, you know, opportunity for us to be able to make a, uh, a full solution for your flow modeling needs. And I'm not going to go into great detail about all of our different products this morning. I instead want to direct you to our website, AFT.com, where you can find that information for yourself. And so if you go to our website, AFT.com, under products, you can read a software overview. And this is where you can find... Uh, bits and pieces of information about each of the different products that we have available, including the modules. If you are in the nuclear industry, then you'd be interested in the nuclear verification and validation, which you can find under services, nuclear VNV. Archon Engineering did a uh, commercial grade dedication to AFT Fathom, Arrow, and Impulse, including the add-on modules. And so uh, if you're in the nuclear industry, you can buy that commercial grade dedication package, and that will allow you to use the software on safety-related systems. A quick tour around the uh, Learning Center. Uh, we have uh, training seminars available. Our next training seminar is coming up the first week of October. And so if you're able to uh, make that time, you can register right on our website. We got, uh, we'll be teaching Fathom Arrow and Impulse that week. And then we also have tons of case studies and technical papers and white papers available. The tips and tricks page is definitely an area where you'll want to be familiar with. We're constantly putting out excellent blog articles on how to use our software more efficiently and effectively. A lot of these, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of these uh, articles come from tech support questions. So chances are, if you've got a technical support question, we've already answered it for somebody else most likely. So go through our tips and tricks page and we probably have an article about how to solve that issue that you might be dealing with. And as you can see, there's tons of, we've got uh, <laughs> over 10 pages of articles. So it'll keep you busy and give you some good reading material. Another area, uh, as you are familiar with our upcoming webinar schedule, we also have our webinar library. This is where you can find all of our previously uh, recorded webinars. 
right on our website. Just fill out the form and you can go to each of these different products and this is where you'll be able to find the recorded versions of our webinars. Uh, here's a couple of webinars that I did uh, last month on AFT Fathom and uh, excellent resources to learn a lot more about our software. Okay, I am going to go ahead and jump into the content of the webinar now. And so we have three add-on modules for AFT Fathom. The uh, Goal Seeking Control Module, GSC, Extended Time Simulation Module, XTS, and the Settling Story Module, SSL. Today, I'm going to focus on GSC and XTS. The Settling Story Module, that's a different webinar. And so if you want to find uh, information on our Settling Story uh, webinar uh, or module, you can go to our webinar library and, excuse me, uh, you can find the uh, webinar on the Settling Story module that I did uh, right in here. It's that guy. And this covers how you would use the Settling Story module for AFT Fathom as well as AFT Impulse. And so... Uh, that's available for you. There is a new module for AFT Fathom and AFT Arrow that is coming down the road very soon. It's the automated sizing module, and that will automatically size pipes inside your system in order to minimize your piping weight, life cycle costs, energy usage, things like that. And it's uh, not available yet, but once it is available, once you get a license, if you click on the button right here to activate modules, it's the automated network sizing module right here. And once we come out with that, that's going to be a whole separate webinar as well. So I'm just talking about GSC and XTS today. Okay, so what is the Goal Seeking Control module? That will automatically change your input parameters in order to give you your desired results throughout your system. And so it's a major time saver. I mean, who wants to sit there and constantly iterate by hand, you know, guess and check and run the model? So if you're really good at guessing, it might take you maybe five or 10 model runs, but GSC will do it much, much quicker than that. And so you can do goals in different ways. You can do a single point goal, for example, I need my temperature to be this, or my flow rate is equal to that. A differential goal is where you have a difference between two locations. So let's say that you uh, have a uh, minimum pressure drop between a valve and a heat exchanger. You can set up that as a differential goal, and you can do minimum or maximum values there. And then there's the group minimum and maximum so for that, let's say that you have a series of spray nozzles and you're trying to modify your supply pressure in order to get a minimum flow rate. That's where you can set up a uh, group max min goal. And I'll show you an example of that later. So uh, very useful tool. Let's go ahead and get into some examples. Here's the first one that I'm going to do. In this example, I have a uh, pump with a set of heat exchangers in parallel. I've got a bypass line. And so the system is modeling heat transfer, and I've got heat transfer through the heat exchangers. And what I need to achieve is a temperature of 120 degrees right here at the branch junction. So the way that I'm going to accomplish that, I don't have any way to be able to control my heat exchangers, so I'm going to control that temperature by modulating the uh, open position of that three-way valve. So let me go ahead and go in here into the uh, model. Whoop, that's the next example. Ah, sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. I uh, uh, forgot to unpause my screen for the webinar. Uh, but don't worry, you didn't miss very much. <laughs> and so all the only thing I talked about was uh, a little tour through our website. Uh, the AFT software overview talks about all of our different products that we have available for you. Under services, this is where you can find the nuclear validation uh, package. And then under the Learning Center, we've got our training seminars coming up. 
The next training seminars are in the first week of October. Uh, we've got our tips and tricks articles, and this is where you can find lots of articles that will help you use the software more effectively. There's at least 10 pages of them, so lots of content there. And then this is where you can find our webinar library. Uh, I mentioned about how I'm not going to be demonstrating the settling story module today. So if you want to learn more about the settling story module, you can go into our webinar library and then under Fathom, uh, scroll down a little bit in the library here. And the module that talks about the settling story or the, the webinar that talks about the settling story module is that guy right there. So uh, that's basically the only thing that I uh, hadn't shown since I forgot to unpause my uh, screen. And uh, immediately after that, I just went through a, a few quick bullet points on what the GSC module does. And then I highlighted what I'm going to accomplish in the first example. Again, my presentation is available to you uh, with the attachments in the webinar. So uh, you'll have that at your fingertips. Okay, so now that everybody can hear me and see my screen, I'm going to move on. <laughs> okay, so here's my uh, system, and I've got my heat exchangers set up to model heat transfer, and they are using a counterflow example or a counterflow thermal model. So here you would specify your heat transfer area and your overall heat transfer coefficient, and then the secondary fluid data is the information on the other side of the heat exchanger. So if I'm modeling the shell side, then the secondary fluid data would be the tube side of the heat exchanger. And the tube side of the heat exchanger uh, might be a gas, okay? Fathom doesn't model gases, it models liquids. And so this is really unique because all you would need is the flow rate, specific heat, and inlet temperature. And that way, you can capture all the heat transfer effects in the model without having to include it on the workspace. And uh, so whenever you're modeling heat transfer or, or anything for that matter, follow the blue highlighting that indicates required input. So if you want to do one of those fancier thermal models, then uh, you would uh, follow the blue highlighting. I am not going to use any of these items as variables in my model, but I want to point out that you can. So let's say I didn't want to use my through a valve to control the temperature. Well, maybe you have the ability to control the flow rate on the other side of the heat exchanger. You can set that parameter as a variable. So there's lots of variables available to you uh, in order to modulate your system in different ways to get the results that you want. And so uh okay anyway uh that's the heat exchanger the uh through a valve right here the way that you would set that up is you would define a open percent versus cv table and so you would have your open percent versus cv for leading into uh pipe number one and uh so i've got my split flow pipes and my combined flow pipes defined right here. So that way, when you specify your CV profile, it knows which pipe that you're favoring from this data that you enter in. After you set up that table, you would then specify what the actual percentage open is for your through away valve. Now, this is just a guess because I'm gonna change that parameter. If you didn't have GSC, then you would have to go in and uh, manually change your open percent there. And that could potentially take a long time depending on how complicated your system is. All right. So what you would do, how do you turn on the modules? Well, one way is to click on the button just to the left of the status slide down here. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to go to the tools menu and then click on activate modules and then simply check the box. So right now I've checked the box for GSC. So the goal seeking control module is turned on for this particular model. So once you turn on GSC, if I open up my status light, there's a new checklist item that appears, specify goal seeking control. 
So if you click on that guy, what you would see is our Goal Seeking Control Manager. The other place where you would find the Goal Seeking Control Manager is from the Analysis menu. What's the Goal Seeking Control Manager? This is where you define your goals and variables. So all you would do for variables is click on New Variable, and then you can change whether it's a pipe or a junction. You would specify what the junction type is that you're going to use for a variable, and then the uh, parameter. Uh, so maybe you want to vary the liquid surface temperature, perhaps. And this is the different uh, junction ID numbers that you can choose. So those are different things that you can do for uh, variables. Now, as you can see from my three-way valve right here, I am specifying some bounds on that, a lower bound of zero and an upper bound of 100. That's because I know that it's physically impossible for my three-way valve to be more open or less open than zero to 100%. So that way it will limit the uh, space where GSC is going to find a parameter to meet your goals. So uh, entering bounds is helpful, but it's optional. Okay, so that's my variable through a valve and you specify the specific junction. So it's that J3 through a valve. I'm changing the open percentage. And then for my goals, I'm going to do a point goal. So again, the point goal is a specific parameter at a exact area in your model. So for a point goal, the object is going to be, you can do a pipe or a junction. I'm going to do a pipe temperature goal of 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you pick a location. Now there's multiple ways to skin the cat on this, all right? One way is you could use a branch junction and you can select temperature and then the associated branch junction that you want the goal to be met at. That's one way to do it. And what that would do is you would uh, have a goal at that branch junction. Now, you can do it differently as well and you would get the same functionality. So instead of using a junction, you can use a pipe. So if I do a pipe temperature equaling 120 degrees Fahrenheit at the, let's call it the inlet of pipe 10, that would be this location right here. Now, in my branch junction, I don't have any temperature loss. Now, I do have a, a temperature coming in here, T1, and then I have a temperature coming in from this pipe, T2. And those temperatures will change throughout my system based upon their own temperature flow paths. So essentially what I'm specifying is I want my mixture temperature, the uh, T mix in that pipe to equal 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Erase all my pretty drawings. I've got my goal seeking control parameters all set up. And as you can see, once you set up your goal variables, uh, your goals and variables, you'll see a V for variable and a G for goal next to the pipe or junction label where those parameters are set. Okay, everything is ready to go. I'm going to run my model. And what might take me five or ten runs to dial it in on an answer, if I'm really good at guessing for that three-way valve, it takes the GSC module probably about... Uh, right around maybe 15 seconds or so. Now, uh, one thing I want to mention is that there's a lot of complexity in this model. There's a pump curve. There's uh, the complicated heat transfer model through the heat exchangers, and there's that bypass line. A lot of nonlinearity for this model makes it highly complex, even though it's a really simple system. And when you're dealing with heat transfer, especially with trying to get that appropriate mixture temperature, then it can take a little bit longer when you're doing those calculations. So it took 20 seconds. If I was trying to do that by hand, it would definitely take me a lot longer, <laughs> unless I knew exactly what the answer was. Uh, so how do we achieve at our results? Well, if we go to the goal, seek and control variables tab, the GSC variables, what you'll find is that your through a valve needs to be 86% open. 
okay? And once your three-way valve is 86% open, you can go to the GSC Goals tab. And on the Goals, so you can control Goals tab, you'll see that your user-defined goal is 120, and the actual goal that was achieved is 120. So GSC did a fabulous job on that. And if I uh, go to my workspace, I can zoom in, I can right click and hold, and you can verify that things were done correctly because you'll see right here that your temperature is exactly 120 degrees Fahrenheit in that pipe. So uh, what's the flow split? Well, you've got 329 gallons per minute going through the heat exchanger path, and then I have 73 gallons per minute on the bypass line. So not a lot of flow in the bypass, and that way I'll be able to get exactly what temperature I want in my pipe. Excuse me. Okay, so that's a very simple example. Let's step it up and make it just a little bit more difficult. So uh, moving on to my next example here is where you have a situation where you've got multiple goals and multiple variables. So in this particular example, I've got a cooling water system, and I am simply circulating cold water through the pump, through the heat exchanger path, and then back into the reservoir. So I've got a closed system. Now I have a couple of requirements. One requirement is that I need to achieve 100, uh, 150 gallons per minute through the hydraulically most remote heat exchanger. That's this guy. Uh, actually, it's not just that. I need to make sure that I achieve a minimum of 150 GPM through each heat exchanger. But I know that mm, J14 uh, since I know that it's my hydraulically most remote, then that's the one I can do a uh, goal based off of. I'll show you a different way that you can do that in a minute here. Uh, the other requirement is that my control valve needs to be at least 30% open. So I have a pressure sustaining valve right here. I'm sorry, a pressure reducing valve, which is controlling the pressure on the downstream side. And so as my pump speed changes, as it's doing the calculations to try and get the minimum flows, my control valve is constantly going to be responding to that. And its open percentage will essentially be changing in order to keep meeting its set point. So that's where I put a requirement to make sure that my uh, control valve is at least 30% open. I don't want it to be 2% open because then I, I'm wasting a control valve if I don't even need it. So I want to make sure that my control valve can have good controllability. All right. Now, back into Fathom. So here's my previous example. Let me know, open up my next one here. All right. Okay, so now that I got my system open, let's see what it looks like without doing the GSC calculation. Uh, this uh, flow path is turned off. So if I just let it run, the pump is operating at 100% speed. And then if I go to my control valve here, it's a pressure reducing valve. So it's controlling the downstream pressure to 50 PSIG. And I have my three heat exchangers. So when I don't do any goal seeking control modeling and I run the system, let's see what our results are. My pump is operating at just under 900 gallons per minute. And my heat exchangers are all uh, very well above that. 150 uh, gallon per minute threshold. So that's good. However, what's the uh, control valve doing? Uh, so I look at my valve summary. What I need to do is I need to add on my uh, valve open percentage as a alpha parameter. So if we look at the uh, valve summary tab, once we add on that parameter, 
ah, there's nothing there. Let's look at this example here. Here's another another way that we can do it. Um, okay. <laughs> so let's say that you're trying to do something silly like how I'm trying to do, and you want to run the model without using the goal stick and control parameters. Well, as you can see, I've got a V for the pump and a V and a G for the control valve. That means that the goal stick and control manager is being used. Well, I want to get my model into a state where it's not using GSC, and I don't want to go in and delete my goal variables and my goals. So instead, just go to the analysis menu and then on the goal seeking control area, just click ignore. So you don't have to do anything. And so when you click on ignore, it'll run the model as it is. So it'll run the model based upon the pump speed at 100% and your control valve operating at your PRV value of 50 PSIG. So here's my open percent versus CV curve for the control valve. The uh, fully open control valve is at a CV of 400. So now when I run my model, we'll be able to see what that open percentage is. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not able to actually meet my set point of 50 PSIG. And so what my control valve had to do is it had to fail open. And actually, it's adding pressure. So let me do something differently here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uncheck that box to always control never fail. I'm going to let the control valve fail. So we'll see what happens here. So I want the pressure to be 50 PSIG right there in the control valve. So if I run the model as it is, control valve fails open, PRV cannot control pressure. If I look at my valve summary, <coughs> that control valve fails open. If I add my open percent for the valve here, you can see that the valve pos uh, position is 100% open, and that's my CV value of 400. Now, here's the thing. When that valve fails open, it cannot achieve uh, 50 PSIG. What's the pressure that it actually gets? It gets a little bit higher, okay, 50.2 PSIG. So that's why it fails open. If we look at our heat exchangers, we are getting the fluid that we want, but my control valve is not even doing anything since it failed open. So this is where I'm using GSC. So let me turn GSC back on. All right, here's what the goal seeking control manager looks like. So here I have two variables. I've got my pump right here. That's one of the things I'm changing. I'm going to change the pump speed and I'm changing the control valve set point. So in this case, instead of saying my control set point is 50 PSIG, I'm just going to let that float. So uh, this is where GSC can help you with remote sensing for your control valves a lot easier. And so that control valve set point is just going to change to be whatever it is in order to accomplish these two goals. Again, I want to make sure that my uh, percent open on the control valve is at least 30%. That way it's not just failed open. And then secondly, I am doing my group goal. So this is the group goal that, <coughs> that I was talking about. So here's what I had to do to get the group goal because uh, there's multiple ways to do this. One way, if you know that this is exactly the uh, hydraulically most remote heat exchanger, then you can put your goal on the heating or the the goal on that specific heat exchanger but in this whole network you might have different pipe diameters different lengths different fittings and therefore this very well may not be the most remote heat exchanger maybe you have a lot of fouling in that pipeline so that would be the hydraulically most remote causing a lot of pressure loss so here's a better way to do this. Uh, give me one second.
Sorry about that. Just had to rehydrate. Uh, if you've not heard me say this before, Colorado Springs is a very high altitude, about 6,000 feet above sea level. It's a very dry climate as well. And I talk a lot and my voice gets very dry and scratchy. So I had to rehydrate there. So if you all of a sudden hear me drop out for a minute on the sound, just give it a second or two. It's because I'm, you know, either uh, trying to get through my uh, scratchy voice and I'm re or I'm rehydrating. So uh, bear with me there. Okay. So in order to do a group goal, what you have to do is select the components or pipes you want to make a group for. So I'll, I selected those three heat exchangers. I went to edit and then groups and I clicked on create. And I gave it a name. Now I already did that. So I'm going to show you the group manager. And as you can see, I've got some groups here. I've got heat exchangers and a heat exchanger group. The uh, heat exchangers, I'm just going to delete that one because I don't need it. So I've got new heat exchanger group. As you can see, the items that I have selected are the three heat exchangers for that group, okay? After you go through and you create the group in that fashion, then you can go back to your goal seeking control manager, and for the goals, you can then do a group goal, okay? So after you create a group, group on the goal type will be available. And this is using a group max min. So uh, you can do max min or a group sum. So uh, maybe you just needed a, a total flow rate through all of them. Uh, but in this case, I want to make sure that each heat exchanger gets at least 150 gallons per minute. So I'm going to do a group max min. <clears throat> you would set your parameter just like you normally do, and then your criteria, less than or greater than, and then 150 gallons per minute. And then here's my group that I created, new heat exchanger group. So that's the group goal that I want to achieve. All right, let's run the model. Now, this is where the goal seeking control module is extremely powerful and helpful because imagine if you were trying to modulate both the pump speed and the control valve set point at the same time by hand, okay? That would be really difficult to do effectively. So if you use the go sync and control module, it'll do it for you in an automated fashion. And uh, also if your system has some uh, high complexities and whatnot, then uh, that can make it even more difficult to manually iterate on your own. Now, right now, it's trying to dial things in on an answer, and I think it's just having some uh, uh, numerical stuff. Uh, let me try something here really quick. I'm going to pause that, go to my solution control. Let's try this here. Hmm. So I must have modified something that I didn't want to do. Let's see. That looks like it's going a little bit faster. I think what might have happened there is with un checking that box to always control, never fail, uh, it could happen where your control valve actually goes into an intermediate solution, which is not your final solution, where it fails open. Well, once it's failed open, it will not be able to regain control. And so I think that's why I got stuck on the last run that I was doing with the solver. And so if you uh, set the parameter to always control, never fail on an intermediate solution, maybe it has to add pressure, but that's not the final solution. And that way it can keep marching along here. So 
Uh, it's probably about to f finish in on a solution here. Basically, what I'm looking at is the uh, best guess. So this is the uh, goal seeking control portion of the solver. So you want to make sure that that value gets to zero. Okay. Once that value gets to zero or close enough to it, you'll have a converged solution. So what GSC is doing, <clears throat> it's running your model, getting a steady state solution, and it checks the goals and variables. And if the goals are not met, it perturbs the variable. It changes it. And so that's where you have the uh, number of calls to the GSC solver. So it took GSC 365 uh, runs to be able to dial it in a solution. Even though it took GSC 365 times, it was only a minute and a half. So really quick. So if I go to my output, let's take a look at our variables. So here, what you see is your pump speed needs to be at 89%, and your actual control valve set point needs to be just under 45 PSIG. That's your variables. How about our goals? Well, if you look at the goals, you can see that your open percentage is right at 30% for your control valve. So that goal was met. <coughs> The other goal is I've got my group goal right here. Now, here's the thing is it's not telling you what the flow rate is through each heat exchanger in this table. Okay. It's only telling you what, or it's only showing you the uh, junction that achieves the minimum flow rate of your goal, 150 gallons per minute. So if you don't know what, uh, junction is the hydraulically most remote, then you can use GSC to quickly figure out which one it is. If you go to your heat exchanger summary, you'll see what the flow rates are. So you got 166, 158, and then 150. And then for your valve summary, uh, here's your actual flow, 475 gallons per minute, and you're at 30% open, and here's your pump operation. So that's using multiple goals and variables at the same time. Let me show you one more quick GSC example. <clears throat> okay, so let's say that you have a situation where you've got a pipeline and over time your pipeline gets degraded and corroded and it starts to wear down your original design flow rate. Well, here's my system which is gravity fed <coughs> and in my uh, piping system i've got eight inch pipe diameter and it's clean steel pipe so the absolute roughness is 0 0.0018 inches so what you can do is you can use the goal seeking control module to figure out how much of a reduction in or how much of an increase in roughness you have essentially which reduces the flow rate so here, 15 or 20 years later, after the system has been ex in existence, uh, my original flow rate is 2,000 gallons per minute. So if I run that, I've got 2,000 gallons per minute. I have measured the flow rate 15, 20 years later, and that flow rate is uh, about 1,600 gallons per minute. So here's what I've done is I've set this up to change the friction on all of the pipes in order to get the flow rate that I want. So I went in and I go to my goal seeking control manager. <coughs> in this case, what I've done is I have created one variable, pipe number one, and I'm varying the pipe friction there. Now, I duplicated that pipe several times and then did it for pipe two, three, four, five, and six. Now, here's the thing. I don't want to have different frictional values in each pipe. I want them to all have the same average frictional value. So what I'm doing is I'm linking each of these other variables back to the original pipe. That way, they will have the same frictional value in the end. For my goals, I know that my volumetric flow rate is equal to 1,600 gallons per minute. 
Now, a side step back to pipe variables is if you do pipe for your variables, you can change either design factor, friction value. So maybe maybe you've done Hazen Williams. Well, if you do Hazen Williams in your pipe models and change friction, now change your Hazen Williams parameter. Or you can change your uh, inner diameter reduction, the, the scaling that you might have specified, or your insulation thickness. So those are different pipe variables that you can work with. So now when I run my model, <coughs> it finds an answer for me very quickly. My goal seeking control variables figures out that the friction that I need to get 1600 gallons per minute is a frictional value of 0 0.016 inches. Well, that's about eight times more absolute roughness than clean pipe. So here, that's a pretty significant reduction in flow. It might be time to change out your piping. So this is how you can use pipe variables to help you uh, calibrate the model for your system. Excuse me. All right, so that's the goal seeking control module. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to help you. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that I basically highlighted the uh, results of our standard example. So if you go to help in AFT Fathom and then go down to show examples and pick your desired units, it'll bring up the examples tutorial uh, help file. This is where you can find all of our standard examples. And then these are the module examples. So even if you don't have access to the GSC module, you can still expand the GSC module example section and you can look at these and read through each example and that'll tell you how to build the system. So this is one of the ones that I showed you here. Uh, this is the other one with uh, doing the pipe calibration on pipe roughness. And then this is the uh, one where I changed the through wave valve position. So that's where you can find your the uh, goal seeking control module uh, examples there. Uh, same thing for XTS, settling slurry, and combining the modules. All right. So let's talk about the extended time simulation scenarios. It's uh, important to account for transients in your system because nothing ever stays the same and your system is going to change throughout the day, and it's really important to capture the overall system dynamics when your, uh, your pumps are changing the operating points, uh, when your uh, valves are opening and closing over time, you've got control valves in the system that are simply responding to other system transients, things like that. The other advantage to using the extended time simulation module is you can... Uh, evaluate how your liquid heights in your tanks will change over time. So when you turn on the extended time simulation module, you can do finite open and finite closed tanks. And that way you can track the liquid height change over time. A lot of times people would do this as uh, traditionally a, a series of steady state analyses, but that can be really cumbersome. And so XTS wraps all that up really nicely. And especially when you've got a really complicated system, you know, it's difficult to figure out, you know, what all your different liquid heights might be at a given point in time. And so XTS will take care of everything together for you. So let me open up the uh, first example here. All right. The first example that I'm going to model here is a very simple valve closure. So the first thing that I did was I turned on the XTS module. I went down here, turned on XTS. There is a new uh, checklist item, specified transient control. That's where you define your simulation period. So I open that guy up. This is how long I'm running my analysis for, 60 minutes. Okay, that's my transient simulation period. And I'm picking a time step of one minute. So it's gonna take data at one minute increments in that 60 minute period. You can also find the transient control from the analysis menu. 
<clears throat> now, what am I doing in this system? It's very simple. I have a valve that is initially fully open, and I'm setting the valve to close within 30 seconds. So as you can see here, my valve goes from 100 CV to 0 CV in 30 seconds. That is how fast my valve is going to close. Now, when I set this up, this time zero uh, value that I'm specifying uh, is not from the beginning of the simulation. So this transient data profile is only going to initiate based upon my single event criteria. So here I've specified an event type to be based upon reservoir liquid height. So if the reservoir liquid height gets to be greater than 15 feet for my discharge reservoir, that's when this transient will activate. So what that means is for the event criteria, if my reservoir liquid height never gets to be 15 feet, then this transient will never activate. That valve will just stay open the whole time. So that's my valve transient. My supply reservoir is infinite. Okay, it's a very large lake. My discharge is a tank. So I'm using a finite open tank. So you can see when you turn on XTS, you have some new options. You can do finite open tank, finite closed tank. Whenever you do any of those, you can specify your actual tank geometry. So initially, I know that my tank is initially empty. It doesn't have any liquid in it. <coughs> my tank is 30 feet high. And so I obviously don't want my tank to overflow. And so once the tank I gets to be above that uh, 15 feet or whatever the parameter was, that's when the valve will shut off. That's the only transients that I'm modeling in this system. So let's run it. This goes pretty quickly. So the question is, at what time does the valve close? Well, if you go to the event messages by time, you can see that your first event started at 35 minutes. The event messages are very useful when you start evaluating your transient results because this will tell you when things happen. So at 35 minutes into the simulation, that's when my liquid height would get to that threshold to shut off the valve. So if I go to my reservoir transient tab, you've got there's so there's two tabs. There's you know the summary tab and then there's the transient tab for each of these. The summary tab, that's your initial steady state results. Okay, that's your time zero data point. If you go to reservoir transient, or also uh, the other uh, well, so if I click on reservoir summary. This is the results of these two reservoirs at time zero. Along the bottom here, if I move time steps forward in time, you can see how the results are changing throughout the system. So that's what you're looking at when you're looking at the reservoir summary. If you look at the reservoir transient, it's a little bit different. The transient tab is a little bit more useful for transient because what you can do is you can expand your whole section for a junction for every time step. So this is the data for every time step in that reservoir. So what I want to see is how that liquidite changes over time. Well, instead of just looking at data, it's easier to look at a graph. So if you right click on that column, you can do a quick graph and there you go. So here you can see that once my liquid height gets to be above 15 feet at 35 minutes, that's when my valve shuts off and then my liquid height stays the same over time. <coughs> now, as you can see here, there's a little bit of overshoot, and that's just based upon the uh, transient uh, time step that you picked there. Uh, one thing I want to point out is my valve closure was 30 seconds. Okay, 
but my time step is a minute. 30 seconds is a pretty quick time closure. Now, what I want to mention is uh, the XTS module does not capture any water hammer at all. So here's the thing. When you have this uh, valve that closes suddenly at 30 seconds, here's what the CV, uh, here's what your valve CV profile will look like. It'll uh, or your this will be the pressure at the valve. Your pressure will stay the same for a long time. Maybe this is uh, 28 seconds. Then the last two seconds, when it starts to close, it'll spike up. So this delta p that you see here is your pressure surge due to a water hammer wave for when that pressure or for that valve closes suddenly xts is not capturing any of that at all okay and so you need to use aft impulse for that so if you were to look at what the pressure was over time what you can do is uh i'm gonna write or i'm going to look at the uh, let's look at the uh, pressure at the outlet of pipe p2 that's your valve inlet so if i go to my graph results window here I can do my transient. I'm going to collapse my quick access panel. I'm going to look at pipes, pipe number two. I'm going to look at the uh, outlet pressure for the pipe. So this is what XTS is saying <coughs> that my pressure will be over time. So as that uh, liquid height changes over time, my pressure increases slowly, then right here at 35 minutes, that's when my valve slams shut in 30 seconds, and you have a, a resulting pressure for the rest of the simulation. So Fathom is showing you that your delta P here is only about probably 15 PSI. Well, is that correct? Most likely it's not, okay? So if you want to see what the actual pressure surge is at that valve closure, that's where you need to use AFT impulse because in reality, your pressure surge was going to be a lot higher, okay? So you're not going to pick that up in XTS. XTS is capturing what's happening over a long period of time, and it's a series of steady-state solutions. It's basically assuming that at every minute time step that I'm getting data, all the water hammer waves, it's assuming that they have all dampened out at that time, which may not be real. Okay. So you might want to look into using AFT impulse as well. Let me show you another XTS example here. In the valve closure example, I talked about briefly what a event transient was. In this particular system here, it's a, it's slightly different. I have a single flow path that is initially turned on, leading to this customer right here. And I have a pump curve in there, and then my control valve is controlling the downstream pressure to 45 PSIA. I've got an open percent versus CV curve. And then at different times, I have these the rest of these customers coming online. So here's another way that you can do this is in each valve, uh, you could do an event transient and choose time absolute, or you can just do time. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the, ab, the uh, time absolute, so about 30 seconds, this valve opens up and then at 60 seconds this valve opens up so each of these valves open up at 30 second intervals the question is uh well what i have here is i have a secondary pump on uh, that is initially off and it's based upon a uh single event transient so once my control valve gets to be greater than or equal to 50 percent open that's why I want this pump to come online. Now, to have it be initially off, I have chosen to use pump off with, excuse me, 
pump off with flow through. I have a discharge valve downstream that's closed. If you have a centrifugal pump, using pump off with flow through is the appropriate choice. And that's because if you didn't have this valve downstream that was closed, your pump could be off, but you could have flow through and that would cause the pumping valve to spin without it being powered. So that's why you would use pump off with flow through, and then you would have a discharge valve that would also be closed. <clears throat> it has a transient set to open the valve based upon that control valve percentage as well. And then finally, <coughs> this is a finite supply tank. We'll see how quickly that guy drains. And on my transient control, this is a three minutes, so it's a very quick simulation. I'm taking data every five seconds. What time does this pump and valve turn on? Well, let's run the model and find out. All right. Perfect. So I'm done running the model. I can go to my event messages. They're sorted either by junction or by time. And so if we look at event messages by time, this is the chronological order in which things happen. Let me move my alpha window over to the side here, and we could look at the uh, model together. So here, this is telling me that valve J12 opens first at 30 seconds, which is great because that's exactly when I told that valve to open. The second valve, J14, opens at 60 seconds. Then this is where you see pump junction number five opening at 65 seconds. So that's when the pump comes online is five seconds after a minute. And then the other two valves open. Well, let's take a look at what's going on here. Uh, let's look at the uh, valve transient and let's see how our control valve responds over time. So if I right click, I can open or I can right click on the open percent column I can do a quick graph, and this will show you how your control valve open percent changes over time. So initially, it stays flat, and then when you have a valve come online, it ramps it up a little bit. And then when you have the second valve come online, it starts to ramp up, and then it overshoots. And so that 65-second period, that's when you're at the 50% open mark. Okay, That's when we want our pump to come online. As our pump comes online and starts helping out deliver more flow, then the control valve doesn't have to work so hard, and then it keeps opening up over time to further accommodate additional amounts of flow. So that's one thing that's going on there. You can also look at your pump transient. You can right-click and show your flow rate versus time. You can show your... Uh, other pump versus time. And so as you can see, it stays off uh, during the entire period. And then 65 seconds, bam, it ramps up. It starts helping deliver flow to the rest of the system. Now, how quickly does that supply tank drain? Let's go to the reservoir transient and let's take a look. So if I expand that column, I can right click on my quick graph or right click on liquidite. So this guy drops off very quickly. So if I was to run the model for, you know, maybe three and a half to four minutes, that liquid height, it, it, that tank is going to be completely drained. <coughs> and once that is completely drained, you'll see warnings in the output that your uh, supply tank is drained and it uh, will uh, not be able to do accurate calculations from that point forward because gas is entering the system. So here's what you could do with this is, uh, let me re-expand my windows here. Another scenario that I could do is I can get another uh, reservoir. Maybe it's an infinite reservoir and another pump and a check valve perhaps. And I can connect these guys to the supply tank. So this could be a regular infinite reservoir. Now for my pump here, what I would do is I would have... You know, let's just keep it simple, and I'll give the uh, same pump information. So there's a, a pump curve there. So I would have this guy be initially off with flow through, perhaps. 
So my transient would be a dual event cyclic. Okay, so a dual event cyclic it has two sets of criteria. There's a first event and a second event. So what I would do is I would set a criteria that would say if the reservoir liquid height is less than or equal to, let's say, one foot in reservoir J1, turn the pump on. Okay, so let's go from zero to 100% speed. My second event would be to shut the pump off when the liquid height gets to be too high. So if my liquid height gets to be greater than or equal to 15 feet, then I would go from 100% speed down to 0% speed in some amount of time. So the really cool thing is as the time goes on and this liquid height keeps filling and draining and filling and draining and filling and draining, this pump is going to keep going on and off. Uh, so, you know, on and off, on, off, on, off, on, off. And that's what you can do with a dual event cyclic type of transient. Now, the check valve works in a similar fashion, like a dual event cyclic. But <coughs> for the check valve, I don't have to define that transient information because it has that dual event cyclic behavior built in. So here I'd have my uh, velocity that closes the check valve and my pressure to reopen it. So you'll see how your check valve opens and closes over time as well. So that's another unique thing that you can do for a system like this is to constantly refill your supply tank over time. Now we can monitor what's going on in this part of your system and see how often that pump is turning on and off. Okay, now there are two other things I wanted to talk about in this webinar today. And so uh, in my webinar, what I did was I discussed the uh, valve closure example as well as the uh, variable demand. The next example that I was gonna talk about is the uh, new feature of how you can do uh, multi-condition events. Now, uh, I'm not going to go through this in great detail because I already did in the Fathom 10 new features webinar, but I'll highlight a few things. So here I have a system where I've got a pump and I have two discharge tanks. Okay, with it being XTS, those uh, tanks are finite open tanks. And I have a cross-sectional area. I think that may be uh, 10 or 20 feet in diameter. I don't remember off the top of my head. The uh, bottom of the tank is at an elevation of 210 feet for that guy, 215 feet for that one. And both tanks are a total of 30 feet high. They're initially empty. So what I have is a simulation that I'm running <coughs> where the tanks are initially empty and my valve is initially open, and I'm filling the tanks over time. Now, here's the thing. There's different flow paths to each of those tanks. So one of them is going to fill up faster than the other. So there's and or logic that you can use with the new event mess or the event mass, uh, not messenger, the uh, event manager. So this is the uh, transient event manager. So I have two different conditions. I have a condition where if my discharge tanks are too high, so that's where my, if my liquid height is greater than or equal to 25 feet in each of those tanks, I don't want the tanks to overflow. So I would have this valve shut off. Okay. The other criteria is if I meet my desired height. So in one scenario, my desired height would be 15 feet, okay? And then in another scenario, I would have the desired tank height be 20 feet. Well, uh, if you uh, want to keep on listening to me, I'll just I'll show this example here really quick. So what you would do is you would set up your, uh, you would click on create simple events, and you would enter all these event criterias and uh, set up your event criteria right here. And then... Based upon what happens, if either 
my discharge tank heights get to be too high, or if they meet the right level, that discharge valve will close. Now, let me go to the model really quick here. Using multi condition events. Okay, so here's my uh, system. So what I have is if I go into my valve on the transient tab, I have multi condition for my event type, and I have three of them. I have my valve shut off being too high, my valve to shut off if it's the correct height, or my valve to shut off if it's at the right height. So what I did was in my multi condition event manager, too high is 27 feet. And then the correct height that I need is 15 feet. So if either of these tank heights get to be 15 feet high, that discharge valve is going to shut. So let's run the model. Let's figure out when does that valve close. Now, while that's running, the last thing that I was going to show you is how you can actually use the goal seeking control module and the extended time simulation module together at the same time. I'm not going to cover that because it's in the examples help file for Fathom. So if you went to help and then show examples, uh, what you would do, so you go to help and then show examples and pick your desired units, it's combined modules, fixed head supply tank. So this example will walk you through the whole process of building a model where it's the last example I was going to show you today. All right, so I've got results here, and I see that my valve closes at 97 minutes. The question is, why does that valve close at 97 minutes? Does it close because I get my 15 feet height in both tanks, or does it close because one of the tanks' heights gets to be too high? So this is where you would use the graph results. So I'm going to do a transient for the reservoirs. And I'm going to plot the liquid height for both of those reservoirs. So as you can see here, as you're marching along in time, uh, let me change this to uh, minutes. So 97 minutes, that's when, one of, that's when my valve shuts. So at 97 minutes, the reason why that valve closes is because obviously the red uh, line is above 15 feet. And now the blue line is above 15 feet. So that's the reason why the valve closed is because both tanks had their desired liquid height of 15 feet. Okay. So that's the liquid height versus time. And that's the, you know, logic behind what's causing the valve to close and win. Now let's look at another scenario. Let's say in this scenario, I actually need 20 feet for my desired height, not 15. Well, let's see what happens. So if I go to my multi-condition event manager, I can simply go to each of these uh, events and just re uh, type in the value and update that parameter. So now, so if you remember the, the previous time, that valve closed at 97 minutes. When does it close this time? And we'll do another graph and we'll see if it closes because the liquid heights are too high or if it closes because of both heights getting the tank height that they need. All right. What time does the valve close? Valve closes at 107 minutes. Okay. That's very different than... 97 and all I did was change my criteria okay I didn't change any input at all I only changed my criteria I need 20 feet now so if I go to my graph results tab let's do that same plot again for the liquid height versus time well here's my liquid height versus time if you start going forward what you need is 20 feet <clears throat> so if you see the purple line uh this is the desired liquid height that you need. Obviously, the blue line, it never gets there. 
okay? So your further discharge reservoir never gets the liquid height that it needs. So why does that valve close? Well, in 107 minutes, it's because one of your tanks gets to be higher than that 27 foot liquid maximum that I want. So that's why the valve closes. So this just goes to illustrate how you can use the multi-condition event manager in different ways. And it's very convenient for be able to do some uh, really complicated and, and uh, uh, powerful types of transient modeling for uh, doing different and or logic. And so that's what that would look like uh, for an example. Um, all right, so uh, that completes my webinar to, for today. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody for their uh, time. And so, again, if you have any questions, please uh, contact us, our other support team or our sales team, which is uh, me. <laughs> uh, you can email me at benkeezer at aft.com and uh, look forward to hearing from you. If you want to try out Fathom GSC or XTS, let me know. I'll be happy to, to uh, set you up with an evaluation license. That way you can try it out for yourself. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day.